Thank you for joining University Libraries and the Greenspun College of Urban Affairs for today's episode of We Need to Talk, Conversations on Racism for a More Resilient Las Vegas. A special thanks to Sarah Mason and Jerry Tomich for funding this amazing series. I'm Clay T. White, your host, and tonight we are discussing how systemic racism has affected our nation's economic policies. Joining me for this conversation are our guests, Nicholas Barr, Assistant Professor of Social Work at UNLV, Alex Dixon, President of West Region Pure Star, Alvin Odom, Senior Manager of Diverse Markets at Charles Schwab Bank, and Shante Patton, Western Regional Vice President of the National Association of Real Estate Brokers. And tonight, please know that you may send your questions in to us as we are talking, and please send them to university.libraries at unlv.edu. All right, so let's get started. So I want to start tonight's discussion just a little different. I want to start out with, with some of the positives that's already happening in the economic community here in this country. So I'd like to discuss some of those positives. Al, Alvin, can you just get started by talking about some of the things happening in the banking industry today to help remedy redlining? Absolutely, and, and thank you again, Ms. Clay T, for having myself and our other panelists today. It's really exciting to get these conversations going. They, they uh, need to happen more often, and hopefully they can happen in a, in a civil way, so it's good to, to be here tonight. Um, yeah, so when we think about um, redlining and some of the things that are happening in financial services, it's almost like you have to kind of go and take a step back in terms of um, what's driving a lot of this, in terms of what organizations are doing from a lending perspective. And, you go back to really a, a regulation from 1977 uh, to begin there. Uh, that regulation is called the Community Reinvestment Act, or CRA. Yes. And CRA was a, a regulation that was in place to ensure that banks, um, they are serving the communities that they're operating in. So as a bank, you can't just take the deposits of the community. You have to also lend to that community, invest in that community, uh, provide services to that community. And so that's a regulation from 1977, and banks are still hold accountable uh, for that today. And that's oftentimes what drives some of the things that we're seeing today that banks are doing. For example, um, you, you'll see institutions that have programs and products that look to uh, increase home ownership through affordable housing products, affordable housing programs. Um, also, you have organizations like, uh, like Citibank. They're doing some fantastic research on how to close the racial wealth gap, which is very, very important. I'm sure we'll talk more about that today. Um, other organizations like J.P. Morgan Chase, they have a, an Advancing Black Pathways program. Uh, that's what they're focused on in, in terms of increasing and advancing black pathways through wealth, um, education, careers. Uh, that's important. On our side, from a Charles Schwab Bank perspective and Schwab perspective, we talk a lot about uh, scholarships. And so our relationships with historical black colleges and universities are, are key. I'm a two-time HBC grad myself. so. Any FAMU Rattlers out there, uh, shout out. And also PV Panthers as well. But uh, we've had a $500,000 donation for scholarships for HBCUs and also an endowment. So $3.5 million for black students who are looking to major in financial planning. Uh, we're working on a program to offer $10,000 in scholarships to those juniors and seniors uh, for going that route in financial services. So I'm inspired by what financial services organizations are doing today. And hopefully look to continue to do in the future. So anybody else want to contribute to that answer on the positives that are already happening? We're gonna get back to that. 
So now let's go back to talk about why that's even necessary. To what got us to this point that banks are now doing these kinds of things. So can we talk about redlining just so that everybody understands what we're talking about? What does redlining mean to you? And anyone can jump in to start this conversation. Shante? Thank you. Um, so the practice of redlining you know, started back in the 30s. And so when President Roosevelt um, was in office, he created the National Housing Act of 1934. And at that time, that was the first time we saw 30-year mortgages come about, low rate um, mortgages. And so it finally made it possible for lower income and minorities to be able to get financing so that they could purchase a home too, which we know is so important because if we look at, at the lifespan of black Americans, it would be similar to playing Monopoly and your opponent was able to go around the board 400 times before you ever got the opportunity to be able to begin to play. So we were always a little bit behind, but some of the issues that we had was during that time, the Homeowner Loan Corporation came out and that's the HOLC. Um, and from there, they created the residential security map, which is where the redlining actually came from. And they would section it off. So if it was green, you know, you were a businessman, you made a lot of money and you lived in the green section. And then it would go from blue and the blue collar workers, people who were working, but not um, from a, a, did not have the income as others had. But then you would move into the yellow, which was the declining areas. And those were your lower income people. And then you would have the red area. And the red area was for people who were foreign born or for black or brown people. And so the issue that we had is that it segregated everyone to these particular areas. So the housing prices were low. If you were able to get financed, it was very difficult to do it in the red section. And it also allowed white Americans to be able to expand out of those areas. And a lot of times, even now, we talk about homeowners associations, but originally their purpose was to ensure that by the rules and regulations of the association, no black people could live in there. And we will still find here in Las Vegas every once in a while, if you sell a home in some older areas, that there are still provisions in the HOA for things like that, and then they have to be updated. You know, but that's kind of where redlining came from. And then since then, it's kind of spiraled out between redlining and blockbusting um, and different practices to keep certain people in areas and out of other areas. So Alex, any comment? You know, I think it's it's uh, been amazing to see the history of just kind of redlining, not only just here within the community, but but nationally. Um, but as uh, you know, kind of government has uh, made advances uh, through you know the efforts of a broad coalition of people uh, to end these practices. Uh, in many cases, it has gone from the individual homeowner level um, now at the institutional level. Um, uh, for entire communities. And so I think what's important where it, it, it hits home for us in Las Vegas is that uh, within the state of Nevada, but in Las Vegas and Clark County specifically, is as we become more a diverse community, um, and we are increasingly doing so, if we look at the, the statistics within our, um, the Clark County School District even, uh, we're becoming a uh, much more majority minority kind of community. Um, and so if you are a lender in uh, New York, who increasingly raises money uh, at an institutional capital level and then is lending it out, um, it is illegal to, let's call it, um, discriminate to people at an individual kind of borrower level. Um, but if you are allocating assets, um, you know what the underlying uh, demographics of, let's say, Las Vegas as a community are. And so if we don't root out this practice at the institutional level, it doesn't matter if you're black, white, brown, or whomever, it's gonna impact the entire ability of a community to raise money for, um, for whether it's housing developments or things of that nature. Because if you say, hey, I don't have to dictate to the individual um, uh, sourcer of loans um, of who they can or cannot, but I will prevent the allocation of money 
to a zone because the underlying um, uh, demo demographics of who they're loaning to mm -hmm. are not something that you either want to invest in, choose not to, or allocate that distribution appropriately. And so I think it's really in, in incumbent to, you know, to kind of put a nail on it that, um, that we r root out this practice um, at the individual retail level as well as at the institutional level. Nicholas? Yeah, I guess um, the only thing that I would add is that I think, you know, in the context of a dialogue about systemic racism in the present moment, I think we need to connect redlining to our kind of contemporary context. So w you certainly know better than I that most people build wealth through home ownership. Um, and while we may have made some, uh, some progress in aligning incomes, um, so for example, I think now the statistics are that African Americans make ab on average about 60% of average white salaries, um, but average African American wealth is 5% of average white wealth, and that's directly because of historical inequities due to redlining. So even though redlining is something that happened some time ago, and now we have rules in place that are meant to prevent these practices, we're still right now faced with the consequences of those, and that's a direct through line from this historical past to present moment um, systemic racism. So, you know, when you hear people on the news debate whether that's a fact or not, it's simply self-evident that it is a fact. Um, and I think we need to make that very clear. Wonderful. Thank you. So, Alvin, did you have anything else to add to that definition or to that conversation? Uh, I mean, so many good things that were said. And, um, you know, Nicholas mentioned something about generational wealth and also historical inequities. And it, it's really interesting. Right. I think there are some some facts and figures that we have to face and um, provide context when we talk about historical inequities, uh, specifically yes. with black people. And oftentimes um, we talk about slavery and we talk about um, in 1619, the first slavery ship coming here. And that doesn't resonate with a lot of people exactly. was so long ago. You know, what impact could that have today still? But if you put that in context then someone put it in context for me, so I'd like to share it here, which was sure. the freedom timeline. If we think about that freedom timeline starting in 1619 and just choose a date and time where we think freedom took place actually, I'm not talking about the Emancipation Proclamation 1863. Let's just push it out and let's just say the Fair Housing Act, 1968. 1968 was 52 years ago. Mm -hmm. 52 years ago. Yeah. Um, and if you think about from 1619 to 1968, that's about 350 years. It's 350 years of intentional oppression, systemic racism. Um, and then in 1968, it was said, you know what, we need to write a law that says you cannot discriminate against someone based on their race, religion, uh, national origin, or their sex. That was only 52 years ago. Exactly. Black folks have been on this country and in this land um, for 400 years. And 85% of the time, that was happening. For 350 years, that was happening. And for only 52 years was it said, you know what, it's probably not right. So I hope that kind of puts into context, yeah. yes, when we bring up slavery, yes, it may have been 400 years ago, but the Freedom Timeline says, if you just kind of draw a line in the sand at the Fair Housing Act, man, there were still things that were happening only 52 years ago. And when you write something in a law, it does not mean that you change the hearts and minds of men. Exactly. So though it was written into law, there's still things that are happening after that that you know, still impact uh, what we're seeing today. Yes, so I tell people that I am four generations from slavery. So that gives, that makes an impact sometimes as well. So I love that analogy. So the home is that possession that builds wealth. We've already started the conversation. So I want you, Shantae, to start talking about some of those numbers Okay. to let us listen to what happens. And then I want other people, at, when she finishes, to just talk about what it means then when someone doesn't even own a home. So Shante? Okay, um, so one of the great things that the National Association of Real Estate Brokers produces is called the State of Housing in Black America. And um, I would first wanna say, we were founded in 1947 out of a need for democracy and housing. At that time, as black real estate professionals, we were not allowed to be members of the National Association of Realtors. 
and we have to create our own association so that we could represent people within our community. Um, and we have fought our battles on block busting and redlining and fair housing. We've been pivotal in all of those changes. Um, so our 2020 State of Housing in Black America report that was just released 48 hours ago um, is very, it, it's, it's startling. Um, so one, our black home ownership rate in the country is 47%. So that is in comparison of 73% for our white counterparts. Um, in addition to that, we are just at that level of where we were in home, in home ownership terms as 1968. So as you can see, we haven't made that much progress um, as we've moved forward. And a lot of that does come to mortgage practices. There was an article we just saw that even when it comes to insurance, you know, we can live in the same neighborhood, drive the same car, and somehow we're paying more for the same things. And so those are things that are concerning um, to us. And so um, the wealth gap right now is 26 percentage points, just slightly lower than the 26.8 that we were in 1960. Some of the other things that we have seen is um, it's been difficult to get younger generations to want to purchase a home because unlike older generations, the American dream is what you grew up on. But in younger generations, you grew up during the recession. You saw families broken apart. You saw homes lost. You saw the financial and family hardship of owning a home. And so we're having to spend a lot of time trying to change their thought process on what home ownership actually looks like. So we know that building wealth um, through home ownership stabilizes communities. It's linked to access a better education. We know that property taxes pays for schools and areas that are better have better schools. You know, so that impacts how our children are being raised. So we know it stabilizes communities. We know that it increases employment um, opportunities. It's safer in homes that are owned. Um, the physical and mental health of owning a home, we tie our success and our wealth into home ownership. And if we're still struggling to even just get there, you know, and be on the same level, that is understandable when someone's been playing a game without us for 400 years. So we are behind and we are having to continuously put the time and the effort in to be able to move us forward. Some of the things that are really um, interesting when it comes to black home ownership is education. And I know we had talked about that several times, but blacks who have graduated from college, it's only 3.2 percentage points higher than that of white high school dropouts. So you're more likely as a white high school dropout to own a home than a black college educated person. Um, and student loans happen to be a huge issue for us. So the black college student has, um, makes up 86.4% of all student loan debt. Um, and they typically on average owe about $40,000 more, but stats have shown us that they still make less money than a non-college educated white person. So they're having to work twice as hard to be able to make a little less than their counterpart. And so those are things that are very, it's, it's very hard, disheartening, right? Well, and thank you for those numbers that are no only problem. 48 hours old, so that's great. <laughs> but you've used a term twice now, block busting. Yes. Could you please explain that to people who may not have ever heard Absolutely. that term? Absolutely. Um, so one of the things that real estate professionals, um, in particular realtors, did is the way they were able to increase their sales is they would go and knock on the doors of um, their white neighbors and say, hey, I heard that the Johnson's house down the street is being sold to a Negro. Do you want to sell your house? And so they were, that was a part of their advertisement, which was to scare people into knowing that black and brown families were going to move into their neighborhoods and that was called blockbusting. And then at that time, it was not illegal. Um, and it was actually something that was encouraged. 
real estate professionals could lose their license or their affiliation with a company if they promoted or sold homes to black people in white neighborhoods. And that's something we're still trying to get past. You know, and we talked about things seeming so long ago. Well, this morning, Redfin, which is an online company, was accused of redlining. That was in the Associated Press this morning. You know, last month in Florida, we talked about the discrimination among um, appraisers. Yeah. So an equal house, when they realized a black family lived there, it appraised significantly lower. But then when that same family, then in an interracial couple relationship, de-blacked, you know, the house and took out all of the photos yes. and the black wife left with the black children and just the white husband stayed, it appraised for over a hundred thousand dollars more. Right. Same house. Right. Hundred and thirty five thousand to be exact. Hundred and thirty five thousand mm -hmm. dollars more. Yeah. And it's hard to be able to justify something like that. So when we think four hundred years or fifty two years, no yesterday. Yes. You know, in this summer. And so that allows us to understand there's still a lot of work to be done. That's correct. Mm -hmm. So anyone else want to talk about housing, um, a family that has no house, that does not own a house, what does wealth look like for that family? Well, I, I think to, to put it in economic terms, um, if we think about the gross domestic product of any region or our nation as a whole, one of the key indicators we look at is new housing starts. Um, and so uh, we're now facing, uh, particularly within this community, but as a nation uh, as a whole, as um, uh, an existential threat to our livelihood as we know it. I mean, uh, the national debt is reaching a level that is just unsustainable. Um, and so if we think about how can we address some of these uh, systemic issues, um, it's actually incumbent that we help to figure it, figure it out because if we're able to close that home ownership gap, that creates new housing starts. So the economy doesn't care, you know, black, white, you know, you know different. Um, the natural consumption patterns of people who own their home um, over long periods of time are different than those who, um, uh, those who don't. And so I think if we not only say, hey, it's the right thing to do, but it just makes flat out economic sense to be able to address this so that we can just generally have more housing starts. Mm -hmm. We will be better off as a community. Our, our schools will be better funded yes. um, and our, our nation can help recover more quickly. Good. Yes. I've got to add to what Alex said and it was, thank you for, for sharing that and what Shantae said also about closing the housing gap and just to quantify that even more and I encourage everyone also, uh, again, this research that um, Citibank's put together, it's called their GPS, so I believe city.com. Um, you can go there and find this research study on closing the racial wealth gap, but a part of that being closing the ho racial housing gap as well from economic terms. You know, as Alex said, um, and what's um, said in this report, uh, if we were to focus, or had we focused on closing the racial wealth gap, the housing gap, the wage gap 20 years ago, okay. um, the quantifiable impact to our economy was $16 trillion wow. today. If we take a proactive approach to help and close the racial wealth gap, the wage gap, the housing gap today, it will contribute $5 trillion over five years to our economy today. So Alex is spot on on the impact of of um, closing these gaps, not just because they are the right thing to do, but because it makes economic sense. Okay. So Nicholas, I want you to also add to this, and then I want you to talk about your research about homelessness. Mm -hmm. so, so please, if you have a, a comment to make before you talk about your <coughs> research, please do. Well, I think my colleagues here are much more knowledgeable about home ownership than I am uh, as, as a renter myself. But, uh, but uh, I think where my research maybe can make a contribution is around um, lack of affordable housing stock uh, for renters, as well as the disproportionate representation of black folks among people experiencing homelessness. So we know that um, black people and black families are, again, disproportionately represented among people experiencing homelessness. So uh, while black folks are about 13, 14% of the population, they're 40% of individuals experiencing homelessness, 40%. And they're 50% of families with children experiencing homelessness. So these are just outrageous disparities. Um, 
And I think that's a national problem, but it's also a local problem. I mean, Nevada just a few years ago ranked last in the nation among, uh, for affordable rental units for people who are very low income okay, or extremely low income. Um, and so if we are going to head off a real crisis in homelessness or an exacerbation of our current crisis, we're going to need to do a lot of work to develop uh, or increase our, our um, affordable housing stock for renters, um, yeah. in addition to, I think, housing starts for first-time home buyers. Um, so, yeah, it's a real issue. And mm -hmm. So what is COVID? What does that mean when we put that in the pot with homelessness? Yeah, well, I guess we're still, um, the Gwynn Center has some great uh, kind of research briefs available, and they are doing a fantastic job kind of putting out uh, really up-to-date numbers. I think we won't know the true impact on homelessness and uh, for probably a little while. It was the same with the um, 2007 economic crisis, evictions and homelessness kind of lagged that crisis by several years. And I imagine we'll probably see something similar here. But we know that there is an enormous unpaid rent debt right now. Um, and we know that we have a moratorium on eviction that will be expiring some time and then we'll have renters who have uh, rental debt that they're just not able to pay and again because we have this lack of affordable housing rental stock um, it's not clear where they're going to go we also don't have enough slack in the homeless service system to accommodate an influx of new families um, you know not to mention we know from decades of research that the way we solve homelessness is by providing housing, yes. no matter what, without contingencies. Um, and so if we don't have the ability to do that, I think um, most scholars would agree that in the next year or so, um, without significant investment, uh, we're gonna have a, a real problem on our hands. Um, anyone else want to add to that discussion? I'll add something um, pretty quickly, and I, I just really appreciate Nick and the research that he's done as it relates to homelessness and, and even the renters also. And, and I think uh, Shantae and Alex would agree with me. When we talk about renters, that is okay. Right? When, we, when we think about homeownership, it's not just putting folks in homes. Yeah. That, that, is, that is not the solution. Owning a home is not the goal. The goal is sustaining your home. And so if we think about renters, you know, being able to provide that rental stock that we're talking about is so important and, and coupling that with education such that someone is ready to own a home, not just, not just to have it, but they are able to sustain that home as well. And that's where we get back to generational wealth and things like that. So again, just want to underscore that, that point, such great information from, from, from Nick, but then also it's not about just getting the home, it's about being able to sustain that home. And so how do we sustain it? When, when we don't even have that knowledge um, about home ownership. I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tee up Shantae. Okay. Um, okay. Because the work that she does in, in <laughs> education, um, that's, that's her lane. So. And, and I've also yeah. heard that you own your first house when you were how old? 22. Okay. So, mm -hmm. so go right ahead. Um, so, so yes, you know, I enjoy the game of real estate, right? Um, but it starts with education. And a lot of times it starts with the re-education because someone has already told them something. And that misconception is a lot of times the reason why they haven't been able to move forward. And so one of the things that NARAB does across the country and we do hit here is we continuously do education. They are called our community wealth building days, whether we go into the church or we do it in a local community, um, area, we are continuously educating. So what we spend time doing is we print off credit reports, we show them how to read it, where they don't have to hire a company to do what they can do themselves, and that's money they can save. So we teach them how to read their credit report, how to save. Our national um, program is called D-Free, and it is an online free program that lets people put in their debts, their interest rates, and walks them through how to pay it off. So if they say, I wanna pay this off by January, it will calculate the numbers for them with the interest rate, because we always think I owe 500. No, you don't, right? You owe like 750, depending on how quickly you can pay it off. And so we have a national program, D-Free, that allows you to be able to figure out how to pay those things off and how to save. The other thing we do is we show them where the money is. 
right? So we get all our down payment assistance organizations in a room and we go through the qualifications and how to get prepared for it. After we do that, we take them through how to choose the best real estate agent, what is title insurance, what is homeowner's insurance, what is a home warranty. We literally take them through every process of purchasing a home from the beginning and to the end. And then finally, we don't leave off the most important part. How do you sustain the house? Generational wealth has to stay insured, right? So we need you to be able to put your home in the trust. Make sure that you keep your homeowners association together. Make sure you have your will in place so that your home is not at jeopardy. You know, how to avoid probate. So we don't have, we don't just stop there. Like, great, you have a home. Because we saw in 2006 and 2007, those same people we were excited for lost their home. And now it's hard to get them to want to do this again because it was such a traumatic experience for themselves and their family. So being able to make sure they understand that part is so important. So my HUD counseling agency, um, NID, that I'm the branch manager of, we do post um, education. So we're there and we say, if you lose your job, if you miss a payment, if you stop making your mortgage, your HOA, call us immediately okay. so that we can walk them through it because our goal is to keep them in the house. So tell me what NARAB is. What is give me those NARAB letters. is the National Association of Real Estate Brokers. Okay. Okay. We have a national goal of two million new black homeowners in the next five years. Okay. And we have different ways to get there. And so now tell me how I join one of those workshops. Okay, so through COVID, um, obviously we're not meeting in person, but quarterly we are doing them um, online and we stream it straight to our Facebook page. It's online, um, you can join us via Zoom. So we're still continuing to educate. And a lot of times people aren't where they are, they're ready to purchase a home. So we spent a lot of time working with the city of Las Vegas and North Las Vegas to bring the pandemic resources to the community. We've streamed that, it's actually still on our Facebook page, NAREB L Las Vegas, NAREB Las Vegas. You can go on there if, if you've had an issue coming up with funds for food or electricity, okay. the funds have not gone away. It's just a matter of people don't know about them. Good. You know, so we spend time there. So. Whether you're homeless and we need to get you into a home or you're ready to purchase a home or an investment property, we have to be committed to staying with you the whole way because life happens. And that's what that's when the, the work gets started because life happens and they don't know who to go to and they get so far behind that we can't help them. Okay. So we make sure we hold their hand to the very end. Wonderful. Nicholas. Well, I just need to get Shante's business card. It's really, yeah. is, is really yes. what I'm thinking. But yeah, the other thing I would add, I think th um, this is such valuable information um, and it's so important uh, I th because it speaks to what you're talking about, which is sustainability. Um, and sustainability, of course, is a kind of key component of resilience. I, I just, I wouldn't be a good social worker if I didn't also say that we have to raise minimum wage. I know that I'm up here with business professionals, so I think there's, you may not always agree with this, but you know, federal minimum wage is 7.25 an hour. It hasn't been raised in decades. You cannot afford median rent in any state in the country if you make minimum wage. So that's just untenable. It's it's untenable. We've got to pay people more money. And and here's the thing that, that uh, I think people don't think about. If you're a business and you're not paying people a living wage, then you're asking taxpayers to subsidize your business. So you as a taxpayer, yeah, you got to think about whether you want to be subsidizing businesses that are not paying people living wages because those people are not able to afford food, housing, medical care, child care, et cetera. And somebody has to take up the slack. So I think if you can't afford to pay people a minimum wage, then you really can't, excuse me, a living wage, mm -hmm. then you really cannot afford to do business in the United States. That, that's my view. It, it, Alex? No, it's, it's a great perspective. I, I'm a clearly, I'm a former small business owner and these, all these comments are, you know, based upon my own perspective. Um, but I, 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 I agree with you. I mean, I think, uh, Nicholas, I, I don't think it's uh, an anthem of being able to provide a pathway um, to allow folks um, uh, who, look, are hardworking 
and it, I think sh people should be able to go uh, to, to one job, hopefully, and be able to provide, you know, for their family. I think what's important is, is uh, you know, as a, you know, former small business owner, it, you know, striking that right balance of how uh, policies are able to be phased in, in order to, to ensure that the ecosystem um, uh, allows people to be competitive, um, because it, it's important um, that we have representation on both sides, because I think a lot of times when when people of color have been relegated to being uh, part of the group that is asking for whether it's a raise a minimum wage a living wage um, sometimes these arguments can get so politicized um, because you have uh, let's say ownership um, that is not reflective of the entire um, entire community and so uh, you know I swear one day I'm going to write a book of you know when they become us um, because I think it's it is w when you know when my family came here to Las Vegas back in the um, in the in the 50s and 60s. This was a very different town, and so we occupied the we were the porters, the maids, the cooks um, who provided you know all of these facilities. Um, you know, I'm fortunate, you know, having served as a president at Circus Circus, um, realizing how you have to balance and make a, a, a P&L statement and looking at labor and looking at all the different things that it takes to run. Um, look, it's moderated me as uh, just as you go through, just as a business person, it does. But what I think is important is, you know, similar to the things we t discussed earlier, is that we as a, as a fair and free society, um, just like we did uh, with Social Security, say um, we think it's right that at some people, people should be able to retire with dignity um, and we're gonna pay into a system that is gonna help people to do that. Um, I think as it relates to minimum wage, um, uh, it, like anything else, needs to be looked at, and, but we need to be able to have a fair um, both process and really understanding the entire um, economic spectrum in which we operate. Here in Nevada, we have a very large um, kind of hourly population um, and our, we have an economy that is dedicated towards it. And so I think um, uh, having conversations almost at this, at this level enables us to be able to get to solutions where we're able to grow our economy, uh, improve the lifestyles of the people who make th this town run uh, and our state run. Um, and so, uh, because it's, it's all tied in together. Um, I do think, Nicholas, you, you represent a big um, sector of our, of our community in that home ownership was really for the la our, our parents' generation, or earlier generations, was the primary way to be able to, to generate wealth. And it may continue to be, but I think there's going to be a continuing phenomenon, which is um, people of our generation are going to have six to seven jobs in multiple different cities. And so... Um, owning a home in every one of those locations where you go along that journey may not, in fact, uh, be an economic reality. Um, as cities have grown more populated, um, the ability for you to have one of these entry-level jobs and own a home in that very same location just may not physically be a reality. Uh, and so while we need to close these gaps, a portion of that can be um, uh, home ownership, but it can't be the only. Um, and so that's why we've got to be able to look at um, the, the wage and earning gap between men and women, um, between um, uh, minority communities. Uh, but specifically here in Las Vegas, we have to figure out how to educate um, our Hispanic and Latino brothers and sisters because they are 30 percent you know, of the state's population. And if we cannot um, make sure that we educate a big portion of our population, we're not going to achieve the economic gains that we need to, um, let's say, as a state. And so, um, although I'm not from that community, I recognize no different than any, whether it's poor white kids, poor black kids, poor, you know, Hispanic kids, we have to produce a median outcome of student um, that is higher in order for us to compete um, on a regional or even national level. Um, and so uh, focusing in on, on you know, the black community, uh, we have to do it because there are inequities that have been assigned to us that are you know, just different. But when you get it right for one population, you can help to take those lessons to unlock you know, economic potential. And I think that's what we have to do. Minimum wage is an important part of it, um, but that in isolation um, uh, needs to be a part of the solution and can't be the only. 
So uh, Alvin, I've noticed you taking lots of notes, so please <laughs> just share. You know, I, there's, there's it's such great conversation. I learned so much from Nicholas mm -hmm. and Alex and Shantae and um, you know, this um, conversation about wage. I think we, we, we also begin by simply acknowledging that there is a wage gap. You know, let's, let's acknowledge that. And again, from, from the studies that, that I'm looking at, again, from, from the GPS report, um, for every uh, $1 that a white male makes, a black male makes 80 cents, a black female makes 70 cents, a Hispanic male makes 70 cents, and a Hispanic female makes 60 cents on that dollar. So that acknowledgement of this exists, these are facts and figures, um, we can take the emotion out of it and think through how do we look to right this inequity that we're seeing, and it begins with this conversation, it begins with all the things that, that Alex and Nicholas just pointed out. Thank you. So. At the beginning, we ask our listening audience to send in questions, mm -hmm. and they have done this at a very <laughs> rapid <laughs> clip. <laughs> so I am going to try to read some of these, and I don't know where to begin. So some of these we may have already talked about. Uh, what more can white people do to stop the ra racial barriers in real estate? So anyone, I'm not, it's, it's not, so uh, I'll, I'll take it uh, okay. uh, with the one caveat of, let's say, real estate. I mean, I think if you just ended at, at racial at racial barriers, what's it, what's been amazing is is um, through in the, the post Ahmaud Arbery, George Floyd conversation, I've had more conversations with um, white male colleagues um, specifically about these topics we're discussing in a way that, you know, I'll be 40 here shortly, that I've never had in my 20 years of kind of professional life. And so what's encouraging about this, and one of the things that you asked earlier about was encouraging, is, is that the dialogue is, something is different uh, uh, because there's always been these issues. Like even after Trayvon Martin, I didn't get these calls. Um, but after this, and I'm, I'm talking about CFO of Fortune, hundred companies, um, leaders of large financial institutions, um, you know, people within our community. And there's been a, almost a hopeless, not even hopelessness, there's a genuine desire to increase their own vocabulary of these topics because it was so visual of seeing uh, for eight minutes, you know, a, a police officer's knee on George Floyd's neck that it is, it's, it's, it's no way to be able to well, only if he did X. And so um, I think we have an opportunity to be able to engage um, at a tone that is, again, just this level to be able to say, okay, what, you know, kind of what can I do? And what I d do and, 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 uh, in, in many cases is for me is to explain, hey, let me tell you about my privilege as a black man. Um, and I've seen this as I've gone throughout my professional career about um, uh, uh, male versus female privilege. And I have privilege as being in spaces that are largely occupied by men and can then develop a relationship um, that is different that just women some, sometimes necessarily can't. And so part of that is being able to say, hey, if I'm able to speak to my own privilege, understanding all the discussions of the 400 years of the 85%, I would hope that you as a leader of an organization could speak to what makes you privileged and what you then can do about it. So as a male in a situation where I have the ability to make hiring decisions or engagement, is I'm now conscious to be able to understand how is my either potential own internal bias or bias that is imposed based upon the system in which we live in helping to me to make better decisions, whether it's about hiring, compensation, of the sort. And so I think if we can use this opportunity um, to, uh, to encourage those who are in power to get in tune to what it was like when your family first came here, you then may be able to think differently about how you're able to use your own privilege to be able to unlock the barriers to economic freedom for everyone. Anyone else want to comment on that, Nicholas? Yeah, I think it's such a valuable perspective. I would say, kind of like to place my response into like two buckets. So one is that, you know, we absolutely must uh, 
identify rules, laws, regulations, policies, procedures that maintain systemic racism and injustice and dismantle them. And then we must pass new ones that address those historical problems. So I think that's one thing we have to do from kind of a policy legal perspective. The other thing is, I think Alvin pointed out earlier that laws don't change hearts and minds. And we have to change hearts and minds. And I think the way that we do that is one, we have to talk to each other. I mean, the, the research is clear that most white folks don't have black friends. And I don't mean they have a colleague at work they say hi to. They don't have a black friend whose house they go to for dinner. Like, when's the last time they hugged a black person? You know, someone who's a actual close person in their life. So I think, you know, people, when they consider these topics, they'll, they'll often say, oh, no, I, I do have black friends. Well, is their number in your phone? You know, like, could you call them up right now? And would it be weird? Um, because if not, then we're talking about you, <laughs> you know. So the other piece is that I think white people often get defensive when we're confronted with the idea of white privilege. And so the way that I've um, had it explained to me and the way that I've explained it to other people and in order to kind of undercut the defensive response, because, you know, sometimes you'll say to white folks introduce this idea of white privilege and they'll say things like, whoa, 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 I, I grew up really poor, I worked super hard, you know, my parents don't have college degrees, like I didn't have any privilege. And what you have to say is, it's not to undermine the idea that you've worked very hard for, to get where you are, it's the idea that in addition to all of the barriers that you had to overcome, you didn't have all these other barriers to overcome that black folks have. So. I think when you explain it like that, it's not as if you had some, you were given some gift, you know, because people don't experience privilege that way. Mm -hmm. It's just imagine what it would be like if you also had to deal with all of these other barriers. So I think, um, you know, again, the two buckets, right? One is the sort of institutional legal framework, but the other is the interpersonal conversations. And I think it's going to be very difficult to change these um, facts on the ground without having human conversations, you know, that's the way hearts and minds and culture changes. Yeah. Anyone else want to speak to that? Uh, Racial barriers? Um, and I think the last part of that was in real estate, right? Yes. <laughs> okay. Um, so I think as real estate professionals, some of the mo easiest things we can do is to check ourselves. How are we advertising? Who are we advertising to? When you put families on a flyer to advertise your real estate services, are they white families? You know, are they interracial families? Are they black families, Asian families? If you tend to only put one type of family on your marketing, you need to check yourself because you have a bias, even if you don't realize. Um, the other thing I would say is out of the 1.4 million realtors, only um, less than 4% of them are black. So if you wanna help increase um, the, the inclusiveness and to be able to bring the dialogue, if you're friends with someone who's interested in business, encourage them to get into the field of real estate. Encourage them, when you list properties and a client says, well, you know, I don't want it to be seen to this type of person or a buyer says, just don't take me to the black areas. You might want to return them back to the office and let them get back in their own car and find someone else who is interested in representing a racist person. You know, at some point in time, money has to come off the table and you have got to do what actually makes you sleep okay at night. You know, because none of the other things will matter. Money comes, money goes all the time. But if you can just be cognizant of who you represent and what you laugh off as a joke among your people, those are ways that you can change. Be open to the conversation, understand that privilege is real and alive. And if you're willing to have a conversation about it, then you're already further along than a whole lot of people right now. You know, but being willing to understand without comparing, not that happened to you, well, this happened to me. You know, and that happened, but this happened. Being clear about what you can do and what you're doing. If you can do anything else, just take a day and document the race, the conversations you've had, the things that people have said to you, the type of people you interacted with. If you went to a business conference, who did you gear yourself to speaking to? Was it someone who looked just like you? Or did you make a conscious you know, decision to go talk to someone that didn't look like you? Those are things that we can do without, you know, taking on the world.
but those are just things that we can do to make sure that we're being inclusive. Good. Alvin? Uh, I just want to underscore what Shantae said about the willingness to understand. Uh, mm -hmm. I think that's, that's great. And I have to go back to something that Alex said because my experience was the same as yours in terms of after uh, George Floyd and the amount of calls and conversations that I had with my white colleagues, friends, and, and things like that. And this is not my lane, but because I experienced it, I want to share it as well. Reliving those conversations and having those conversations frequently um, means that you have to be very intentional about maintaining a healthy psychological well-being. Mm -hmm. and, and Alex, I don't know if you experienced that, but I had to take, take, take a step back, yeah. take a day, call my buddy, yeah. ask him how, he, how he's doing, yeah. allow him to vent, and um, for me to, to share and unload on him and unpack on him so that I can have an effective conversation with my white colleague. Yes. Um, self-care is important. Self-care is important. If you catch me on the, uh, on the wrong day, yes. <laughs> you, might, you, may get a, you may get a different response. Yes. But you know, back, back to that, that question related to you know, what um, can someone who's white, uh, what can they do? You know, again, something that was shared with me and I'll, I'll share it here as well. Um, I think one thing is understand the difference between and distinction between um, equality and equity. And when you think about equity, you must think in terms of outcomes. And we've talked about outcomes you know, on this panel. And you have to understand that in order to achieve equitable outcomes, it may require inequitable inputs. In order to achieve equitable outcomes, it may require inequitable inputs. So if I'm in a position of power and I say, man, this is, a, this is an, an inequitable outcome. I am searching for this, uh, this outcome. What do I need to do? What more might I need to do in order to achieve this, this equitable outcome? It may be because I'm a business owner that I want my sales force to reflect more of the communities that we serve. I might need to go an extra mile um, in terms of the, the pool of candidates that I'm interviewing. Um, and just to kind of take it down even, even further, uh, if you're an individual, maybe that inequitable input to achieve an equitable outcome are conversations. Maybe they're conversations with your friends and family who maybe have a narrow perspective on the issue. And uh, maybe you can, by um, uh, viewing panels like these and doing your own research, you may be able to offer a broader perspective on an issue yes. that your friends and family maybe, maybe didn't have before. Um, so I just, I, I go back to that, you know, in, in terms of equality and equity, think of equity in terms of outcomes, okay. and what role will you play what inequitable inputs will you contribute and commit to to achieve equitable outcomes? Wow. Okay. One thing yes. I'd, I'd add um, <coughs> in the spirit of the question is I think get, getting really tangible um, with, uh, let's say, what can be done. And so I think if we think of here in our community where, where you know, gaming is, the, is the, 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 the core business, there are hundreds of casinos in our community. Um, um, uh, but if we look at the, the people who are either running those facilities, um, it's not reflective, let's say, of either the customer base that we're now starting to attract mm -hmm. or um, the population, let's say, that is here. And so specifically, um, we for a very long time have been able to be um, dependent upon uh, a big portion of our business is both conventions as well as mainland Chinese who are coming to Las Vegas. And so based upon coronavirus, um, uh, both of those have limited. And so what it's done, it's, it's created a spotlight on the drive-in market, particularly coming from Southern California. And if we look at the diversity of that community, um, it is, um, uh, again, increasingly, um, increasingly diverse. Um, and so uh, I think if we think of only diversity in the form of, if I think of a company's profit and loss statement as a function of, let's say, our HR or feel good or community spend, we miss out on the fact that if we had a more reflective marketing base, uh, property operator base, ownership base, that we may be able to unlock economic potential that is different to be able to make uh, our community much more resilient. And so there's specific data points that you can speak to. If you look at a, on the presidential ticket right now and you look at the impact of adding a vice presidential can candidate to one side, you can see how the, the numbers of overall um, f uh, fundraising has gone up. I think when you look back to be able to see, okay, hey, what was the difference or what segment of the community 
it's going to be that you had a different segment of the American population who is now giving um, disproportionately, uh, let's say, to a candidate. If you look at Marvel and you look at the impact of Black Panther, you had a movie that specifically catered to a segment and they were able to do just as well on of many of their other, you know, the movies that were able to go through. And so I think this doesn't have to be a, a handout. Yeah. This doesn't have to be a taking from one group to the next. In many cases, it's an absolute case of our survival as a community that we have to, in 20 years from now, we can't not have any Hispanic general managers if a third of our, our market is, you know, coming from Southern California, which is 40 to 50 percent Latino. It just doesn't make economic sense. And so we've got to track for consumer businesses how much your revenue is coming by different communities. And you as a leader, you as an owner need to be able to speak to it because you may be missing out on economic opportunity not just an opportunity to give people a job, not opportunity for X, Y, Z, is we can make more money if we organize ourselves better. And I think if we can do that as a state, as a community, and this is a broader economic e ecosystem here, we can come out of this better because we're gonna have to um, because mainland China is not coming back for a while. Yes. So this is so interesting I've gotten to one question <laughs> out of the staff. Sorry, a little long-winded. <laughs> but but this, this is so good that I, it's, it's just amazing. So I just want each one of you now to give me your closing remarks um, in, in any way you'd like to do that. Just whatever you'd like to close with because we're that close to the end. So let's start at Nicholas and come around. Oh boy. Um, well, first of all, I just want to say thank you. Uh, it's really been fascinating to be on this panel uh, with everyone. And I think it's nice as an academic to kind of get out of my office and talk to folks who are involved in all these other d interesting projects. Mm -hmm. So thank you so much. It's really been a privilege. I guess, um, you know, again, my focus is on uh, homelessness and trauma. And so I um, am really passionately interested in preventing uh, what I see is a real um, potential increase in homelessness uh, in the next mm, year or so. So I just want to implore community leaders, businesses, local politicians, thinkers, thought leaders, everybody, uh, we need to think about how we're going to generate investment to prevent an increase in homelessness. And that's to keep people who can't pay rent or can't pay their mortgage in their homes. And that can't be done at the expense of landlords and you know business owners. It, it really has to be a collaborative effort that works for everybody. But it is in everybody's best interest to do that. So um, I, I guess that's what I would close with okay. other than that. Thank you. So we have about one minute each. Alex? It's a pleasure to be with you. Uh, our best days are ahead of us. Um, I think having conversations like these uh, are going to make us better as a community. I think you're right. Shantae? Okay. Um, there are two and a half million black, realist, black households who are mortgage ready to go. So find a way to be educated and start building wealth because we know it secures our neighborhood to provide better education for our families and it increases our physical and mental health. So you might not get it anywhere else. Double down on your generation and protect your assets. Have about a half minute. <laughs> <laughs> um, education is a great equalizer and accountability is necessary. Wonderful. I, I, thank, I thank you so much. This has been so enlightening so educational. I've learned so much. This is amazing. I thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Thank you. So I want to thank everybody for this enlightening conversation and we need to continue talking. Our next panel will address education, health care, and action steps. November 19th, our panel includes our new UNLV president, and we can't wait to, to hear Dr. Whitfield, who is a scholar. He's in the fields of psychology, health, and aging. So wonderful. You have to listen to that conversation, all of you. So thank our sponsors again, University Libraries, 
the Greenspun College of Urban Affairs. And our advisory board at the library, Sarah Mason and Jerry Tomich. So this has been wonderful. I just appreciate everyone and everything that was said. They have those two women whose name I just shared with you provided the funding for this. And this is why, because of amazing panels like you. Thank you. So stay